Now is the time. Uh, all right. It's not many of us, but whatever. Uh, we're going to have a very different course now. I thought about it and decided to change the rules completely. Because I noticed one unfortunate thing, that I sit here and I write code. Right? So the idea is that I am proving to you that I can write code. Well, guys, it's irrelevant whether I can write code or not. I'm an old guy. You know, Even if I know it, it's besides the point. So we need to figure out if you guys can write code. So we are going to introduce certain magic. They have this magical spoon, which is going to be used. This is truly a very important spoon. It says BTL, Bell Telephone Laboratories. And for all we know, Claude Shannon and Arna Pences and Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie had their great inspirations after they touched this spoon. You know, it's a very rare spoon. Might be the only extant spoon in the world which says BTL because uh, when we were young uh, Bell Telephone Company didn't trust its researchers not to steal spoons <laughs> so that's why they marked it uh, at some point they got rid of them that was the last spoon and I stole it <laughs> so, they were right so this is the only criminal act which I ever committed, sort of. I don't habitually steal things, but I couldn't resist. So we have this Claude Shannon spoon, and we're going to use it in the following way. The person who holds the spoon writes code. And till the moment when I say spoon move, then the person gives it to whomever he likes, a random person. They say, I don't want to be involved in deciding who is writing code when. Right? So, I, you know, you are my colleagues. don't want to call you. Because at my previous company, Adobe, I used to call people. And then people started complaining. He's singling me out. I don't want to single anybody out. It's the spoon. We use this magic spoon. So that, you understand the rule? And uh, sort of the only issue which we have is how to initiate the thing. So let me suggest we use somebody totally neutral, my friend Paul, who is going to give it to someone. When I say, when I say, not now. So, and then you understand the algorithm, yes? So uh, I'm not going to type because some people here, especially Ryan, say that I'm a terrible typist and the class is not going any place. Because, you know, my hands shake, I hit wrong things. So we're going to use automatic typing system. This is whatever the person with the spoon says is going to appear on the board. That Ryan invented this magic system for doing that. So totally magic class. Uh, OK, so you understand the new changed rules? I don't do any work. You do the work. The spoon is the enabler. OK, but before we get, go to writing code, I still want to pontificate. After all, that's like why I'm here to pontificate, say profound things. You know, when we started this course, we said that the course is about components. And what, what is a component? But if one view of a component is you take a piece of code, rip it out of something, that's a component. Well, let me tell you, no, it's not a component. It's a ripped, it's like, if, if you rip a piece of meat out of my leg, it's not a functioning component. It's a pound of flesh, right? So component is something which solves a problem in a general way, right? It's a, something which is not specific and then could be used by all the applications which need this particular problem being solved, right? So, and then comes another important question. People sort of keep bugging me, like Greg comes to me and say, why don't we use Go? And some people say, oh, but Scala is a wonderful language. And there are many other things. So let us discuss a little bit about 
what components are in terms of programming language. Okay? I claim that a programming language is suitable for component program if it satisfies the following condition, two conditions. First, you could describe a general purpose component, first condition, yes? But then there is a second condition, without losing efficiency. That is very, very important. Because obviously, in any language, you could construct something which, you know, you know, as long as your language is Turing complete, you could describe just about anything. But it might be very, very slow. There are many languages which claim to possess powerful abstraction facilities. But if you start using these facilities to everywhere, for example, if you say, from now on, in my language, I'm no longer going to use in 32 I'm just going to use integer with a capital integer. I don't know which language I'm talking about, but let's assume there was such a language. Guess what? If you start doing it, your performance is going to collapse. It's not that you're just going to be slow. You're going to be slow compared with the stuff written in this language without abstraction. That is, efficiency is a twofold efficiency. A component is relatively efficient if, when instantiated, it's as fast as a, nat is a code, non-generic, non non-component code, written in this language. Right? And component is absolutely efficient if, when instantiated, it is as efficient as anything which could be done on a given machine. Basically, you know, it's as fast as assembly language. These are two different kinds of efficiency. And again, the reason I'm using C++, people say, Alex, you use C++ because you sold out to dark forces. Guys, if I sold out to dark forces, I wouldn't be working at my age, right? So very clearly, I, you know, I didn't sell out. So why did I start programming in C++? After all, I didn't start with C++. I started to program C++. I still program in C++ because as far as I could ascertain, it's the only language which allows me generality and absolute efficiency. That is, I can program as general as I like, which is I could talk about things like monoids and semi-groups. Those of you who attended my previous class might remember what they are. On one hand, on the other hand, when it compiles, I could look at assembly code and say, this is good. Right? That is, there is absolute efficiency. Right? So now we get to a, an interesting question. But how do we know that a language is powerful enough to do that. And long time ago, I came up with a test whether your language is good enough. And you could say, well, you could come up with the following test. If you could implement a major operating system, this is a hard test. And you obviously don't know whether you implement it in a general way or not. So I came with a very, very simple test. And I claim this test, which allows me, I still use it, to determine whether a language is suitable for what I want to do or not. There are three programs which I need to implement in a general way to know that a language is suitable. These three programs are swap, a program which takes two things, and swaps. Min, the program which takes two things and figures out which one is smaller. And the third one is linear search, the thing which somehow goes through a bunch of stuff and finds whatever. So in other words, you say, well, Alex, aren't these too simple? Well, guys, if we cannot do simple things, I claim, that is very unlikely we will be able to do hard things. Actually, all my life I have problems. 
You'll say, no, 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 Alex. You know, I don't know how to solve these problems, but I could do something much more complicated. At that point, I say, well, look, uh, I'm not interested. Because I want to see solution to, to simple problems. But people always think that exciting things have to be very complicated. I claim exciting things tend to be very simple and basic. So these three pro so every time you want to come to me and say, Alex, why don't we use a new language? Three programs. Go try implementing them in your favorite language. When you do them in a general way, and they're at least relatively efficient, that is, they, they're not slower than, than specific things written in, in, in this language. Then let us talk. If you cannot do it, let us still stick with C++. I'm just explaining the, the reasoning behind my, my choice of C++. And of course, here we also have a large body of people using C++, which is convenient because, you know. But it soon might change. You might all soon switch to a much better programming language, as you well know. So, uh, but let us still look at these three programs. And by the way, anybody sees why they are important? Why is swap important? What does it deal with? OK, why don't we write it? Then we will see. Do it. The spoon goes. Just. <laughs> no, 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 but you know, he, his task is to initiate the process. I had nothing to do with it. It was not. OK, so let us try to write swap. OK. Uh, how, would, I mean, how would you go about writing swap? You could dictate the code will magically appear there. You have, there has to be a file called probably uh, swap.h. Okay. So what is it? Is it a class, a function? We're going to define a function. Is it a function or template function? Well, it needs to work on any type. So we're going to be does it have to work on any type, or there are some restrictions on the type? That's enough? Here's the man, guys. Let us give him a chance. OK. Start writing. OK. So we're going to define the function swap. Uh, it takes uh, two things of the same type. So how would you say that? Um, so we're going to say uh, T A T space A comma T space B. Say that. Um, we want to pass by reference. So we probably don't want to say T. Probably want to say T ref. Very good. And it's going to be void. It's going to return void. Yeah, it's you swap. The way to change it, change these things. <coughs> Just have to do with assignment. We need to change. No, assignment was forced upon us by you know outside people who told us assignment has to be. And nobody told us about swap, so let us not do evil things. Sort of things which we define, let us do properly. Okay. So we're going to use Moreover, let us, let us discuss that. that. Even if you wanted to return, which one would you return? Um, not really clear. So I think that your original, sometimes, by the way, it's not always the case. But often, the original intuition is good. Yeah, let's return void. But I don't think it will compile like that. Yeah, yeah we need the template thing on top. He says. 
And what do we say? Well, this exercise is very exciting. I do not program by speaking. <laughs> we will learn. We will learn. Computer. <laughs> okay, but now let's think about it. are there any requirements on on T uh, I, I interfere put new line slash slash let us after that we'll figure out what is what do we know about t is it just any type okay let's write code then we will know what to write down now let him do it let him do it you'll get the spoon one day if you behave Uh, what? Okay, so we're going to need a temporary variable. Of what kind? Of type T. Uh, T-ref. You need T-ref. Let us think about it. what does it mean? What does it mean that... Uh, let us write and see what happens. Tell us. We need to get the value of one before we... And to get a value, what do we need? We need T. You see, remember, value means T. T ref is a reference. We do not create a new value. And you want to create a new value. That's very good. That's very good. I would, of course, call it TMP. <laughs> I have been doing it for the last 30 years. I'm, I'm. Yes. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> okay, so we say temp equals A. Okay, so now we move A to temp. So now A equals B. And then uh, B equals 10. Very good. Pa spoon go. All right. Who wants it? No, 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 no. It's not how it works. It's not you are not. It's no, it's yeah. just by you just. I learned the word back. Yeah. And whatever. <laughs> ah, that's how it works, yeah. And I don't want to be part of this. Just the next person. Okay. Your name? Uh, requirements. Assignment operator. Yes. Default constructor. We don't explicitly use it, but we probably want it. Yes. And what do we call types like that? We encountered them before. We talked about them. Semi-regular. Semi-regular. Semi so, probably need to say T is semi-regular. Okay. I think we, we're done. This is wonderful, by the way. Uh, there's only one word missing. Thank you. Yes. Because, you know, we really want it to be efficient. And here, yes. Can't we use a copy constructor instead of the assignment, the tempo? Of this is a copy constructor. This is a copy constructor. There is assignment is used on lines two and three. It's copy constructor and two assignments. Uh, of course, like, since we're, you know, a way of assuring that it is, it's writing, let me tell you everything. If you're not sure, Replace it, yes. Do this. And if you're using C11, there is a, the most general and proper way to do it is by replacing parents with braces. Really. I'm just telling you, you still cannot do it, but eventually that will be the way. 
you suppose to initialize things. But if the type of temp is the same as type of A, writing the way we wrote it in the beginning is identical. It calls a copy constructor. Very good. So Nick suggested inline. Uh, I, by the way, highly recommend putting inline on a separate line. Sorry that I'm picky. Why do I recommend that? But it's not, yes, it's not a part of the signature. And specifically, when you search for a function, you, you want to search for void swap when you want to find its declaration or definition. You don't want to be bothered with this inline. Now, I have to stop once. We will never talk about it again, hopefully, in this course, about word inline. This is one of the things which will go away. It is there are certain things in C and C++ which are there because compiler technology is imperfect. When I started programming in C++, which was in 1986, I believe, I had to write everywhere in my code word register. Because believe it or not, compilers wouldn't use registers unless you specifically indicated that something goes into the register. And of course, this something, if it went into the register, you could never use address operator. Because obviously, registers do not have addresses. It was a very special thing. You needed to worry about it. And it was important. On my measurements at the time, stripping register declarations and fundamental algorithms caused factor of three performance degradation. Anybody could explain why factor of three? Load store edit. I mean, you have plus. For every plus, for every one operation. So at that time, long time ago, computers used to do one thing at a time. So it was surround every one thing with couple of, with load and store. It basically tripled, tripled the, the the, the, the time. It's, by the way, this is no longer true, meaning that uh, computers no longer execute one operation at the time, as we will discover. And for sure, you never need to worry about registers. In modern computers, this is utterly idiotic. You should never do it. You should, the same way compiler is perfectly capable, theoretically, to figure out what needs to be in line, much more than you. But we are living in this steel transition time. So I think about five years from now, you never need to write in line. Compilers will do it. Right now, as we shall see when we get to measuring times, it still makes a difference. You remove this in line, and you could get enormous performance hit. I mean enormous. This could be a factor of 10 or something like swap. Because the problem is that the function called sequence is a bad, bad sequence. And it breaks instructions. I mean, there we will see consequences. So this was a very important thing. Now, you think, oh, we're done with swap. Well, uh, there are more to, to say about swap. First elementary step which we need to say about swap. Uh, what if we don't have an extra memory location to store it? Could we do swap? Yes. Yes. There is a very beautiful algorithm. Let us write the code. Oh, actually, the neighbor write the code. He's the man with the spoon. Let's call it swap XOR. Then inline void. Inline void. And the same signature. Uh, T reference A, T reference B. Is it, what is the type of T? It could be anything now. Could it, really? Could it be a vector? Uh, 
Okay. Okay, first of all, let's write the code. We will we will we will see this. Do you know how to write the code? I don't know this, uh, Pass the spoon. Okay. Do you know how to write the code? Uh, I can try. Very good. Let's try. You know, you should all, guys, by the way, always try. What's the worst thing? You know, I write bad code all the time. XOR would work on integers? No, 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 but before let's write the code. Then we'll figure out when it works. Remember, you have no memory, so you cannot declare temp because you just run out of memory. The stack is full. No registers, no anything, whatever. So you need to do it. How could you do it? He told you. But could you? Could you? Yeah. Okay. Or D. X or B. <laughs> okay. Okay. A, X or is correct. XOR. No, no, no. What he means. Yes, XOR. D. Then. B equals AXOR. Yeah, AXOR B. Very good. You don't have the spoon. So A equals AXRB. Very good. OK. Why does it work? Let's prove it right there. So what you do, you put slash slash at the end of every line and try to tell what is now. Let's write new value of A followed by new value of B. Then new value, no, 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 I mean, he will so after we, we're done, what's the new value of A? I would just write that it is, I think, the new value of A is A, X, or B, yes? And B is B. So this is, makes it very complicated. So. The way I would write it is literally I would just write A XOR, the hand B, comma B. Right? And then we do this. What is A now? What is A now? Nobody else? A is uh, A XOR B. And what is B? B is now A. Because you see, it's A, X, or B, and B. B cancels it. Everybody follows? And finally? A. No. No. A is B. And what is B? Is A. We accomplished what we wanted. Right? It's a very simple algebra. We used it very good. Okay, pass the spoon. A random person, whomever you like, your worst enemy. <laughs> Arnab, yeah. <laughs> okay, what's the requirements? I mean, uh, it needs assignment, of course. And so it it's clearly needs assignment, but it also needs XOR. So what are the guys who have XOR? Log logical? I mean, you know, which types could you use XOR? Name me one type you could use XOR, somebody. Int. Is it a good idea to use it on int? No, it's a very bad idea. <laughs> It works, but it's a bad idea. We will discuss in a second. 
why is it a bad idea to use it on int? It works, but it's a bad idea. This works because C allows it, therefore C++ allows it. But then they define it in a very interesting way. What do they tell you? They tell you, of course, you never read language manuals, most normal people. So you just get it by osmosis. And therefore, you might not know that all the language manuals tell you that the result of XOR for the signed bit is not defined. It's implementation dependent. That's what it says. That's what it says. It's basically, if it is a positive integer, I mean, you know what is going on. For the sign bits, you have no idea. When it's negative, what will happen? That's what it says. Therefore, if it says so, it's useless, I claim. Because you, you need, so it's a very good thing to use it for unsigned int. Because at least you know what it will do. Is it the only type you can use it? Char. Of course, not just char. Who has the spoon? And he's not talking. So what you could use it for unsigned int, and what else? What other primitive data? Yeah. Could you use it for 64-bit integers? You can. What about 16-bit integers? 8-bit integers. So it's a very safe thing to use for all the unsigned integral types. This is, by the way, there are some other types for which you could use it, but let them remain secret for a time being, not to get you confused. So basically, this is unsigned integral is the correct requirement. Do not use it for signed. Is it, by the way, useful? No, it's not particularly useful. But again, I wanted to discuss the algorithm. Now we get to a very important point. OK, so if we keep this code on top, is it always good? Give a spoon to someone. Let them suffer. Is it always good? <coughs> will it always work? Yeah, it will work when it works, or semi-regular. But being good, what else do you want? You want it to work, and you want it to be? Yeah, correctness is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, we want it to be correct. But what else do we want? Fast. We want it to be efficient. Okay. Could you give me an example of this thing being horribly inefficient? Here's the spoon man. No, with very good assignment. Everything is good. This is not an exceptional situation. It's a very common situation, which happens all the time. In you know, causes problems. So when this code will be slow? It's good. Now, let's ignore the XOR. When is the first such a basic function? And in some sense, self-evident function. You agree, it's self-evident. It is self-evident. Yeah? But what I claim, there are cases very important cases where this thing is utterly unacceptable. Therefore, we will have to do something major about it. Any container. Let us, OK, pass this point to somebody else. Let us try to see how we could apply it to a container. No, 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 you, you couldn't. No, you cannot do it. You have to now give an example of using swap function with a container. Do, do you know what containers are? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, do you know what a vector is? Vector is a container. Okay. Let's try to do it with a vector. Could you dictate an example, code example, of using swap with vectors? Like actually using like the vector C++ vector? Yeah, like C++. This is the language called C++ we're using. It's redefined, but now you take it a vector of T. So how do, we, how do we take it? So just the template type. No, we don't need any template. How do you declare a vector of integers in C++? vector and then braces age inside it? Just like that, yeah. It's helpful to say STD. Yes? And then we need to do what? Yes, that would help. Give it a name. A. Work. How many things do you need to test our swap? How many things do we need in two? Now, yeah, we could do that, but let's do it on separate line. Okay? This has one little problem. These are very small vectors. Could we make them big vectors? How do we make them big vectors? Initialize them with like element items? With size. What's a good size? One million that somebody suggests. He's a very experienced guy. Listen to him. Do you agree with one million? OK. One million. Now, now let us assume that you apply this swap to this NB. What happens? Now, yes, but let me tell let him tell us what, what, what will happen. You had the spoon. It's swapping <coughs> basically the variable in be not like it's not going through the all the elements. <coughs> oh, it is going to go through all the elements. That's the bloody problem, pardon my French. That is the problem, it is going, by the way, correctness, is it correct? Is it going to do correcting? Yeah, yeah it's going to do correcting. Okay. Is it going to do it fast? What do you think? Why not? OK, let's move the spoon. Uh, because it's going to swap every single element. No, no, no. Tell me what it's going to do. No, it's not going to swap every single element. Actually, it isn't. Oh, you have the code, guys. Have the code. Just read. Tell me what it's going to do. It will construct a temporary vector. Yes, Jack? That's what it says right there. Does it say that? How long will it take? How long it takes? A million elements. Yeah, long time. Right? You agree that it will take more than like five instructions? Probably so. Probably so, yes? So then what is going to do? <coughs> the next line. The next line. Yeah? It's going to do the same thing. It's going to keep old B untouched and create a new vector, new value in a vector A containing all the guys in B. Yes? Another million operations or so. And then finally, whatever it constructed. Yes? One more time. Three times. Do you like it? Jack, be brave. Say it's bad. 
It is terrible. It is terrible. It's very slow. It is very slow. So what we have, we have what appears to be generic code which works everywhere, except it's very slow. So is it acceptable? No, it's not acceptable. If somebody comes to it and says, I have a wonderful generic solution, very abstract, but it takes million operations instead of three, throw him out. There is no excuse for, for that. No abstractness, he says, but I could use tropical semi-rings. Take tropical semi-rings and do something to him and them. <laughs> so uh, you have to figure out a way. What is, by the way, let us ignore languages. What's the algorithmically right thing to do? Give, 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 give the spoon to someone. Oh, lucky Anil, yes. <laughs> okay, Anil, what's the algorithmically right thing to do? Never mind how we do it in the language, but what's the right thing to do? Okay, let us, for those of you who, who sort of confused about what's going on, what is a vector? Vector is this thing oh, which contains a pointer to the large area. Actually, it contains several pointers, but it doesn't matter. It's a header which contains a pointer to million elements. So what should we do in you? should swap, swap the pointers, pointers that are in the header structures. And? Should we do anything else? That, I, he has the spoon, guys. Let him decide. Do we need to do anything else after we swap the pointers? Well, it actually the, if you want to know the implementation, which, which you actually do, it's three pointers at present. It's the pointer to the beginning, the pointer to how much it's filled up to, and the pointer to past the end. Three pointers. So, yes. And after that, do we need to do anything else? Just say no. No. It's, you know, guys, there is a word. It's a good word. No. Okay. So, what about lists? Lists. Linked lists. They're known in C++ as lists. Uh, std colon colon list. Will it work? Is it good? No. How do you implement it? <coughs> Uh, again, you want to swap. Oh, maybe I should give these food. No, no, give this. <laughs> no, guys, it's my decision. It's my decision. It's my decision. Otherwise, people, the spoon will be just flying. So, again, there you have, um, you have a, you have a pointer to the beginning of the list, and Okay, so what I am trying to say, I'm, this is this is I'm trying to torture Anil to say, Socratic method has its limits. Uh, basically, you need to swap whatever information is in the headers, and possibly adjust back pointers if the data structure contains back pointers to the header. Do you agree? That's basically what you need to do. All right. Therefore, what we discovered is that eventually we will need to write a specialized swap. This is a swap for all simple things. You couldn't do it any different. That's the way you do it. But if you construct a container, and what is a container? Could you simply tell me what a container is? Anil, you have this spoon. Tell me what a container is. I mean, in your own words. Something that contains. <laughs> <laughs> and this containment, what does it mean? 
What does what does it entail? It it allows you to work with many elements as one. And these elements are what's the relation? Yeah. They're owned by this object. Right? If we think about we will talk this is not the time or the place, but I need to, to tell you eventually we'll have to study data structures, otherwise what could we do? Sort of what we do, we basically declare this one object. Right? So they go together. These things are owned by the header. Right? So and we will later on figure out all the operations. And for things of that nature, we will have to redefine swap. And we we already sort of have a conceptual swap, right? For them. What do we need to do? Swap headers and then and if there are back pointers, fix back pointers. Right? So sort of we know roughly how to do it. It would be wonderful, by the way, to have a language where we could just type that and compiler will do it for us. Sadly enough, we're not there yet. What do you mean the things belongs to the class? This is a this is swap operation does not belong to the class. Why? Why doesn't? Where's the spoon, the spoon man? Why doesn't it belong to the class? Well, in the case, for example, of the simple one, then you would have to keep writing it for each different uh, simple. Yes, and more importantly, what is it? What kind of object is this? What kind of thing is this? What kind of thing is it? It's a function. It's a function. It doesn't belong to any class. It's not a member function. Right? Pass the spoon. Uh, so we get we get to what do you know what you're really a C person, I remember. So do you want to try? Okay, give it to somebody. Just the next victim. Okay, you, you should be ready for that. So what is the operation when we're going to define this thing for containers? What are we going to do? We're going to, there is a term. Do you know what the term is? So we have, this is the most general definition of the swap. Yes? Do you agree? The top, the root. If you know nothing, use that. Then we will somehow define it for in more special cases specialization yes yes but we're going to define it not we're not going to define it for say vector of int we're going to define it for vector of t therefore this kind of specialization is called Partial specialization. We're not fully specializing it, yes? Right? So eventually we'll learn how to do that. And they're going to be, again, global functions. They're not going to belong to a vector. They might be friends of a vector. Well, they better be because they're going to deal with private members of a vector to, to deal with that. But they're not going to be member functions. Right? So, and there will be, eventually we'll have to face horrendous problem with dealing with namespaces and what you see, what you do not see. I, you know, for the next several lectures, there are no namespaces, except for STD, which we write without understanding what it means. But you who really program, actually, eventually we'll have to figure out what namespaces are. Okay. So, are we done with swap? Feeling sort of comfortable, swap a little bit. Huh? So, what is the next step? What min? Okay, want to have a go? Okay. 
Oh, we have full solution. The first solution is absolutely full solution, except we will have to. No, we'll have to later on when we do vectors and lists and other containers learn to do that. And we discussed how to do it. But since we, I mean, you know, I could go and teach you that, but there, you know, there are these 10 directions sort of there. But let, let me talk right now because there is sort of swap is a very important operation. By the way, it, apparently it's not self-evident. Once upon a time, I was talking to a very famous programmer in this building, uh, supposedly the best programmer they ever had. And I told him about these three things. And uh, remember, swap, mean, and lean, and such. And he looks at me and says, I never had to use swap in my life. What? I don't know. So I, I was very impressed. Because why I was very impressed that you never had to, to use swap? Where do you use swap? For sorting, for reversing the sequence, for rotating the sequence, for all kind of operation. Basically, and if you do something with the sequence, you then to do to use this operation swap. So it is a very important operation practically. But it also happens to be a very important operation theoretically. Because long time ago, when people were starting group theory, they discovered that any permutation of a sequence could be generated out of swap. Swap is the most primitive operation there is on a sequence. And any other permutation could be constructed out of swap. But not apparently, not everyone, even famous programmers, I suspect Paul knows whom I'm talking about, uh, uh, re realized that. And actually, well, he had to claim that his language, or the language he thought was the greatest language, was great. And since it couldn't do swap, what do you do? You deny the utility of swap. So, but when you check your language, see if you could do swap there. Okay, let us go. Want to try mean? Okay. Let us say mean dot h. Template type t, type name t. Sounds good. Written type is t. And mean. Written type is t. Computer. Mean. <laughs> Mean. Sorry, you gotta speak up. Mean. Mean. Function. <laughs> and then T reference A. T left B. So I forgot in line. Um, <coughs> um, if A less than D. This is what I want. This is beautiful. You know, brave, brave gives the code. Now I could get at it. So, but guys, that's the whole point. Okay. Calm down, calm down, calm down. You have a spoon? No. no. And calm down. I feel it's powered here. <laughs> that's good, that's good. It's all Claude Shannon's, you know, mind contained of this spoon. Okay, okay. So first thing we need to think about is that you decided to pass things by reference. Yes? So let us think about a simple example. No, 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 no. You don't know the question. So you decided I'm not questioning your decision. No, but let me finish. Then he will amend the code. Could you say mean 5, 3? Will it work?
Will it work? 5-3. Do we want it to work? Yeah, we want it to work. What, what do we want it to return, by the way? Anybody know? Three. Yes, that's the correct answer. Yes. So, but will it work? Yeah, it will accept it will not compile. That is the problem. Do you agree it's a problem? If it doesn't compile. It's a problem. I mean, Benoit issued an edict that we are not allowed to check in code which does not compile. So now we know. So whatever the theory says couldn't work. So why doesn't it compile? Let us, let us, we need to understand why. I mean, so, so compile is broken. No, it's not the problem. The problem is before that. What are five and three? Very good, but he should say that. They are literals. Yes, they are literals. Right? This is this hardwired constant, five and three. So they're not really, in some sense, in some other language, they wouldn't even be objects at all. They would be this floating values, five and three. But in C++, they are automatically converted into uh, object. What kind? Integer. What kind of integer? Constant integer literals are going to be viewed in this constant in, in this context as constants. And what do you say? You should if you want it to work for five three. Right? So that's what you want to do? Let's do it. He said. Oh, it's done. Wow. This is faster than thought. Yes, that's really impressive. So, const, yes? Now, what do we return? Well, of course, you could say, let's return t. But then what happens? You know, let's now, just for an argument's sake, let's imagine that you have two gigantical objects, one like that big, another one even bigger. And you look at min. Do you really want to copy? You don't want to copy. Because what's the point? I mean, you know, if somebody needs to copy, if the client wants to copy, so what would you do? Would you turn CRF? That wouldn't work. Why wouldn't it work? Const, const. I mean, these are two, five, and three. They're hardwired. They're these bits are unchangeable. You couldn't return them as a non-const reference. So you return them as const reference. Yeah. Just this is. Otherwise, compiler will scream and rightly. And now. We stop for lunch and then we continue. Uh, no, we don't stop for lunch. Uh, well, we, I mean, the food is there. It looks delicious. I don't know what it is. But we have to, Paul says, stop for lunch. You keep the spoon, all right? By the way, the person who loses the spoon, eternal damnation, guys. 